apparently, and uh, we can get started. Hi, my name is Jim Lakely. I'm the Vice President and the Director of Communications here at the Heartland Institute, and we are uh, very pleased to welcome you to the special Zoom webinar, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with big tech titans, how states can protect freedom of speech. Uh, the Heartland Institute has been working with our friends at the Media Research Center in, in a large coalition uh, to fight for free speech rights online. And uh, that's what we're going to be discussing today. With that, I will actually hand this over to our proper host, and that would be Cameron Schulte, our Director of Government Relations here at the Heartland Institute. Each of these gentlemen are going to be uh, giving their remarks, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. I will be monitoring the Q&A, so you can either uh, put it in the Q&A section here in this webinar or in the chat. I'll monitor both, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. With that, take it away, Cameron Schulte. Thanks, Jim. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our webinar today with uh, Brent Bazell and uh, James Taylor and myself. Um, I want to take a moment and introduce uh, Mr. Brent Bazell. Um, he is a lecturer, syndicated columnist, television commentator, uh, debater, marketer, businessman, author, publisher, and activist, and one of the most outspoken and effective national leaders in the conservative movement today. And we're happy to have him um, with us. He is the founder and president of the Media Research Center. Um, he runs the largest media watchdog organization in America. Uh, since its launch in 1987, DMRC has developed the largest video archive in the world. The popular newsbusters.org blog site, the cnsnews.com internet news service, MRC Business, MRC Culture, and uh, in April of 2014 launched MRC Latino. The MRC has over 650,000 members nationwide with over 12 million fans on Facebook. Um, after uh, Mr. Bozell speaks, we'll move to James Taylor. James Taylor is an attorney from Syracuse Law. He is the president of the Heartland Institute. Um, and for years prior to that, he, he headed the Robson Center for uh, climate change at the Heartland Institute and speaks nationally and locally on issues and frequently testifies before state legislatures and um, interest groups on the effects of climate change. So I also am going to, at this point, take a moment and kind of change our run of program and make note that um, because of Mr. Mazel's busy schedule, we may have to, if you have questions for him, um, we'll jump into those questions um, shortly after he speaks and then move to James. Uh, Mr. Rizal is very busy, of course, and we want to make sure that everybody who took the time to join us this, this afternoon um, has a chance to get answers uh, to whatever questions they have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Bazell. Thank you, Cameron, and uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Hartman, uh, for, for inviting me to speak to you all today. Th th this issue of censorship, social media censorship, I think is not just existential um, to, to a cause of liberty. I think it's existential to the United States of America herself. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, you can't have a functioning democracy if you can't have freedom of speech. And what you were saying is that the future of speech, uh, not just in America, but in the world, is through so social media. And uh, the, the, the giants of social media are actively engaging in the censorship of that very speech. It's, it's remarkable that, that uh, uh, men like Mark Zuckerberg talk about how, how the business model of Facebook can't exist without uh, the public square um, being open to the public. Um, well, what they've done is shut down the public square and uh, the public doesn't have, increasingly doesn't have access to it. Now, am I exaggerating? Well, facts speak for themselves. Uh, you can argue, and we will argue, that big media and social media together stole the 2020 elections. Um, no, I don't mean the, the stealing it in the way that perhaps uh, the former president brought it up. I mean it from the standpoint of withholding information from the American people, which information had the American people known about 
uh, would have dramatically changed the outcome. Just to give you one example of this, um, conservatives might find this hard to believe given that Fox News was talking about this every single day or Rush Limbaugh was talking about it every other day. Uh, but look, here's the reality. 36% of Joe Biden's voters had no idea of Hunter Biden. 36% of Joe Biden's voters knew nothing about the Hunter Biden sketch, uh, uh, scandal. Why is that important? Because 4.6, this is a national survey we took, 4.6% of Biden's voters said they would not have voted for him had they known about the Hunter Biden scandal. If you took that 4.6% number and put it across the electoral landscape, Donald Trump would have won all five contested states, Minnesota, Michigan, Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona. I believe they were. Take those numbers and, and, and Donald Trump would have won in a landslide election against Joe Biden. That's how important that censorship of information was. The second big takeaway is that the, the media, the social media giants decided they were going to censor the president of the United States of America. If you can censor the president of the United States of America, you can censor anyone. And that is precisely what they have set out to do. Before going into that, just consider who these, these companies are. These are the largest corporations in the history of man worldwide. Um, these, are, these are companies that dominate each one of their industries. They dominate um, uh, to, to, to the extent that companies like Apple have got a trillion dollars in cash so they can buy anything. Amazon, I believe, is now about to become a trillion dollar corporation, as is Google. Uh, so they can buy anything. You can't compete against them. Whatever they want, they get. And they've taken the position now that if you don't like what they say, they'll simply remove you. And if you are even an organization like Parler, they'll destroy you. So what have they done against the president, former president? 17 major um, uh, social media sites have now censored the former president of the United States. It's, it's all the big ones. It's YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Reddit, TikTok, Shopify, Shopify, even shopping social media sites um, are, are censoring the former president of the United States. Um, 17 companies. Think about this number, and this will put it kind of in perspective. Since May 31st of 2018, Twitter censored Donald Trump a total of 625 times between May 31st of 2018 and January 4th of 2021, uh, 625 times. How many times did they censor Joe Biden? Answer, not once. That's 625 to zero. I don't know. I, it's my, somebody might suggest there's a, there's a, there's a slant there. Um, even when the former president gives an interview to Newsmax, as he did on February 20th, way after the election, and talks about the election, even then, they, YouTube took him off of there because it was not, quote unquote, in accordance with our presidential election integrity policy. In other words, what Donald Trump was saying was something they didn't agree with, and therefore, they took him down. This is happening, this censorship is now happening across the board with all the big ones. Take, for example, Amazon. You now, people don't think of Amazon as one of the big social media sites. Well, Amazon, um, if you're a book publisher, if you are an author of a book, I think it's either like 85 or 90% of books are now sold on Amazon. So Amazon has a, a, an almost complete dominance um, of, of the market. Well, Amazon has now decided they're going to allow some books to be sold and some that cannot be sold. One book that cannot be sold is any question book that questions their agenda, uh, agenda on, on gender identification. Uh, for example, a book, well, When Harry Became Sally, responding to the transgender moment. 
that was banned by Amazon because because it goes against the narrative. Books by Adolf Hitler and books by Karl Marx are okay. They're available on Amazon, but don't question transgenderism. Um, uh, uh, there was a documentary that was released on Justice uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas during Black History Month. Amazon Prime Video removed it. So you can have videos on Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You can have a, 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 a video on Stacey Abrams, the gubernatorial candidate, the nut from uh, Georgia. You can, have, you can have a video about Anita Hill, the accuser of Clarence Thomas, but a sitting Supreme Court justice can have a video on Amazon. Um, Amazon, uh, in one study that we discovered, Amazon was selling 204, remember you know, all this stuff about hate and conservative hate and conservative doing hate speech and all that kind of stuff. Amazon selling 204 different items promoting violence against conservatives or Trump or Republicans, 204, including t-shirts that uh, uh, have um, kill all Republicans on them. And that, that is okay, you can sell that on Amazon, but don't say anything about transgenderism. Um, YouTube, uh, YouTube, Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson tweeted in uh, January 27th about how you had two scientists testified under oath uh, in the Senate about COVID. Yeah, both of them were, 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 were yanked from YouTube because somehow they weren't telling the truth to YouTube while they were uh, speaking under oath in the, in the Senate. In fact, the CEO of YouTube has boasted about the fact that they have removed 500,000 videos dealing with COVID if they went against the narrative that, could, that YouTube wanted, which is to say the World Health Organization. So if you question it, if you have an opinion, other than that, you're not allowed to, to uh, uh, show a video on, on um, uh, COVID. As a matter of fact, uh, the president, former president of the United States um, couldn't have his own speech uh, said that he gave at CPAC. That was yanked down uh, from two different sites that carried that speech. Twitter, um, Twitter continues being Twitter. It is now banning one conservative after another. And in fact, they are saying, see, people like Steven Crowder are saying that they are being banned and they don't even know why. They're just being taken off. Newt Gingrich was censored because he questioned COVID. He also talked about illegal immigrants. He was taken down from Twitter for that. Uh, on and on and on the examples can go. I, we can give you literally hundreds of examples of, of what is happening. Um, conservatives are fighting back now and there are three different arenas that, that are being pursued. The first one is Section 230. Um, how in the world these companies, these massive companies have a protection nobody on this Zoom call has um, is beyond me. The fact that none of them can be held liable for libeling people. So, so they can destroy people and yet nothing can be done because they've got this very sneaky protection under Section 230. So we're moving to get them get get rid of that or to change it um, so that they are treated like anyone else. The second arena is antitrust legislation. There are now 18 different states that are pursuing antitrust legislation that are saying quite simply, these companies are too powerful. You can't compete against Amazon. You can't compete against Twitter. You can't compete against Facebook. You can't compete against YouTube. The third one is what's happening at your level, at the state level. And that may be the most exciting of them all because you've got 50 states and more and more of these uh, states are coming forward with their own solutions to this at the state level, not waiting for Washington, D.C. A final point. Nothing is going to happen in the next um, two to four years, or in the next four, four years at least, on the national level against these companies. Um, they, the, the Biden administration is chock full of employees, former employees from these companies that are now working for the Biden administration. These companies pour hundreds of millions of dollars 
into the process. They bought Washington. Guess what? <laughs> I'm, I'm living in a city that's for sale. Um, the highest bidder gets it and big me, now social media got it. Um, so so uh, they own this Congress. They own the White House. Nothing's going to happen uh, un, un, until, until there really is an effort made by serious men and women to stop what is the greatest threat to freedom, I believe, in, the, in, in, the, in this nation's history. Those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Brent. Um, Jim, were there questions? To, if anybody has questions, throw them in the Q&A um, uh, or the chat, and we'll get those answered. Um, Let's move on to James. I think we can, uh, uh, we can get to those questions here in a little bit. OK, very good. So I'll uh, refresh for those uh, that joined late. Um, James Taylor is the president of the Heartland Institute. He's also the director of Heartland's Arthur B. Robinson Center for Climate and Environmental Policy. He is an attorney for, uh, from Syracuse University. Um, he's been featured on CNN and MSNBC, Fox Business Channel, Fox News Channel, um, and various other TV and radio outlets across the country. Uh, James is going to kind of talk about some of the lay of the landscape on big tech censorship. And when he concludes, I'm gonna jump in and kind of talk about what we're seeing in the states and some of the arguments for and against um, legislative action on this issue. So with that, James, please. All right, thank you, Cameron. And uh, thank you, Brent and Jim. I would like to jump right to what I think is the most important thing for state legislators and the general public to understand about this issue. Because we have been told this myth over and over again that Section 230 precludes states from passing legislation that would protect uh, people's free speech rights on the internet. That is a myth. Yes, federal law preempts state law where the two conflict, but Section 230 does not give the tech giants, the tech cartel, the right to censor political free speech. Now, this is something that of course, I understand that the tech giants, the tech cartel have been giving a lot of money to a lot of people and a lot of organizations on both sides of the uh, political aisle, really all sides, all uh, parties in the political spectrum. So that is a myth that has been repeated. But if you look at the statute, and that's what you have to do anytime that there is an assertion that a law exists that requires or prevents certain activity. Look at the statute. Don't just believe it because, quote, everybody knows this is the case, or I've heard this on, on the internet or on cable television over and over again. Section 230 is part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Let me repeat the title of that because it's important. The Communications Decency Act of 1996. That act specifies that Congress is very concerned about the ability for people to post excessively violent or sexually obscene material on the internet. And whereas Congress wasn't going to prohibit that, Congress was going to say, look, we understand. Of course, keep in mind back then in 1996, you did not have the tech cartel you have now. We understand that the hosts of internet sites, platforms, social media, may wish to prevent sexually obscene or excessively violent material on their websites. We don't want them fearing lawsuits for doing so. So we're going to make this act, we're gonna put into place this act that says that if such a platform decides to block sexually obscene or excessively violent content, they can do so and they don't have to fear tort claims for doing so. That is the entirety of the statute. By the way, a couple of things to also keep in mind regarding this statute. I'm going to go to section B3 uh, and I'm going to read verbatim. It is the policy of the United States to encourage the development of technologies which maximize user control over what information is received by individuals, families, and schools who use the internet and other interactive computer services. Again, this section 230 explicitly says the purpose is to maximize user control, not Facebook control, not Google control, not platform control. Now, 
under what circumstances or under what justification do the tech giants claim that they have this mandate that they can block anything they want under any circumstances? Well, again, this is the Communications Decency Act. Section C, this is where they claim they have their justification. The title of Section C is, quote, protection for good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. Good Samaritans blocking offensive material. And what it says is that if a provider in good faith, and it emphasizes good faith, so it doesn't say you can do it for any reason whatsoever, you have to have a good faith finding that the protections apply to, it says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of any action taken voluntarily in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. Now, that last phrase, or otherwise objectionable, is what the tech giants are hanging their hat on. Keep in mind, it's under a bill that's a Communications Decency Act. It's under a section that says Good Samaritan blocking of offensive material, and every single example listed is either sexually obscene or excessively violent. What you have is one clause at the end, or otherwise objectionable, that clearly is applicable to and limited by that particular title and classification it must be sexually obscene or excessively violent. Otherwise, you do not have the authority, you don't have blanket authority to play God in terms of what you do or don't allow on the internet. And if you had any question about that at all, again, in the uh, preamble here, it says, any action voluntarily taken in good faith. Well, if you have any reason whatsoever that you can cite, good faith is irrelevant. Again, it shows, good faith shows that what Congress was addressing, both in clear intent and the statutory language, is only sexually obscene or excessively violent material. Now, based upon the myth, the tech cartel, through the organizations that they fund, through them putting out papers and statements, and then Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, go anywhere you want across the aisle on, on cable television, they hear it so much they assume it's true. State legislators need to know it's not true. You have the ability, if you so choose, to put into place legislative causes of action legislative prohibitions against tech cartels restricting political free speech for the citizens of your state. And if the tech cartel decides that they would like to invoke Section 230, fine, let them show that what they're prohibiting is sexually obscene or excessively violent. Otherwise, they do not have that right. Whether their talking heads say so, whether the public policy organizations they fund say so, whether they themselves say so, it doesn't matter. That is what the law is. It's also important, not just for state legislators, but for the general public to understand this, because the more it is repeated over and over again, as if it's a fact that everybody knows it cannot be disputed, the less likely it is for policymakers, the courts, and very importantly, the court of public opinion to understand that yes, we do have the right to insist that we can speak freely, especially on political topics and cultural topics on the internet. Now, I'd like to touch on one other point before turning it over to Q&A, but that's the one I want people to remember, especially state legislators. Don't be cowed and bullied into thinking you can't institute a cause of action because you can, and federal law does not block it. Section 230 does not block it. Now, at the Heartland Institute, we believe in promoting, developing, discovering free market solutions to societal problems. And for me, the default position is can, does, will, would the free market solve the problem? And if we can find that, then of course, that's where we should go. In this case, although it offended me over and over and over again to see public figures, to see elected officials being banned from presenting information in their view constituents, and even more so seeing common citizens who don't have access to their own website or don't have access to, to speaking on cable news, common citizens being banned from sharing their political views on Facebook or Twitter or elsewhere. As much as that offended me, I still thought, well, hey, this is a problem. The market will solve it. Somebody else will see that there's a market for this and they can build another. They can build a competitor to Facebook. They can build a competitor to Twitter. Parler did that. And it's not that everybody in this country can go out and build a competitor to Twitter and Facebook. 
it takes a tremendous amount of money, resources, resolve, action. Very few people can do it. I still trusted the market. The market succeeded. Parler, the parlor was, parlor was built. Parlor was put online. And then the tech cartel destroyed it. Absolutely destroyed it. Parlor may or may not be able to come back in some way, shape, or form. But that shows us that, in this case, we don't have a free market. Keep in mind that these corporations, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, exist only because they take advantage of corporate law, which allows them to consolidate their resources, to grow as large as they have, to, to have these protections that they have. Keep in mind that Section 230 is itself an abrogation of the market in common law. When the tech cartel says free markets should decide, they're fighting against tech, they're fighting against free markets each and every day. Anytime they rely on, two, on Section 230, they are relying on something that is not a free market mechanism. And of course, 230 has, it had good intentions, excessively violent, lewd, lascivious, obscene material, allowing people to say, hey, if I'm hosting a platform, I don't want this on my, on my platform. But now what they're saying is that gave us a blank check to do anything we want, including these multinational corporations telling Americans what they can say, think, and share in terms of our political speech with our friends and our neighbors, and even our elected officials communicating with us. That to me is a huge problem. And when the market stepped in to try and solve it, the cartel smashed it. So it's my hope that state legislators that are watching this, people throughout the country who are watching this, we're powerless only if we allow ourselves to be powerless. But we can step in, we can take action. And I hope that we'll do so, so that our free speech rights, which are the first and foremost rights that we must cherish and protect in this country, will continue to be protected, even against multinational tech cartels. So thank you for, uh, for being here. And I'm happy to take questions, as I am sure Brent is. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we actually have some pretty good questions that are that are getting lined up here, and uh, some of them have to do with what Brent just said. Some has to do with what you just said, James, and uh, a few of them actually have related to what Cameron Schulte, our director of government relations at the Heart Institute, is here to talk about as well, and that is part of the title of this of this webinar, which is what the states can do to fight for free speech rights online. So, uh, Cameron, we're ready for you. Great, thanks, Jim. Um I'm, I'll be brief because uh, James and Brent did such a great job, but I'm going to share my screen. I just have some things I wanted to share with um, the people who are watching at home, and I, I may or may not get to some of the questions that have piled up, but I kind of wanted to go through um, what we're seeing in the states and um, what some of the legislators um, out there have been uh, working on. So anyway, quick introduction. I am the, I, my name is Cameron Schulte. I'm the Director of Government Relations at the Heartland Institute. Um, right now, we are seeing, I, well, actually, let me back up real quick. I'm actually in Tennessee today and um, through, through Wednesday in Tennessee, um, away from the home office in Arlington Heights, because tomorrow and Wednesday, again, I'm testifying on legislation on this very issue, both tomorrow and Wednesday. So where we're at is there are currently 28 states looking at about 47 bills or resolutions um, on, related to this issue. Um, here's, a, here's a map, if, if you guys can see it. Um, a, a, as you can see, Tennessee's leading the charge. They've got almost, I think they've got about six bills looking at this issue. Florida, Kentucky, Missouri, um, with several different approaches. Texas um, uh, just uh, unveiled a bill. So anyway, these are all the states that are looking at this issue and looking to uh, rein in big tech. So which leads me to how are they doing it? There's basically four concepts or four ideas that um, legislators across the country are using or, or, or they're attacking this issue. And the one that is the most common is creating a civil cause of action, which basically allows um, individual users of a social media platform to sue Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or what have you, if they have been censored for political or religious speech. Um, and, and that's an important distinction I wanna make here is that these bills are 
only about religious and political speech. This is not a throw the door open to making lewd, lascivious, um, violent speech um, sanctionable. It, this really is about preserving political and religious speech. Uh, the second approach that we're seeing in the states is empowering attorneys, uh, the attorneys general and, and or a consumer protection agency inside the state to investigate and bring penalties. Um, this is similar to what you'd see in an antitrust lawsuit. If there is a big company, local, national, what have you, that is distorting the market and is, is acting monopolistic, the, in, in these cases, uh, the attorneys general are empowered to investigate and bring penalties. A uh, third one, which um, the state that jumps out at me is Alabama. The third one is withholding economic development tax credits and payments. Uh, that's, that's actually one of the more creative ones uh, uh, in my personal opinion. I think this one actually rides really well is, is, is a good tandem to um, the first or the second approach. So basically what you've seen, and, and we're all familiar with what happens when Amazon announces to the world that they're going to open up a new distribution center or a second or third headquarters, states will trip over themselves to give tax credits to bring the Amazon money to their state to build these large massive facilities and to employ the residents of those states. And they do it with tax credits or outright payments to, to uh, Amazon. So what that third one does by withholding those tax credits, what you see is, or, or the approach, the, the concept really, is that when, it, if it is determined through investigation by an attorney, um, by the attorney, a state's attorney general, they will um, withhold tax credits and those payments directly to Amazon in this case, as an example. Uh, and the fourth one, which is um, something that Governor DeSantis has mentioned um, down in Florida is canceling contracts. And that, that's kind of a nebulous one. And it took me, as a matter of fact, a few, uh, a, a little bit to figure out how would you cancel a contract with Twitter or Facebook or Amazon. And then here's where it became clear to me. This is an example of the legislation in North Dakota. If you go to North Dakota's legislative website and look at their bill, um, House Bill 1144, which is actually a civil cause of action legislation. Um, if you look along the, in the address bar, in the URL bar, you'll see that the legislature has hired Amazon World Services to be their web host. And without knowing what that contract is worth, if North Dakota decided to cancel um, or, or if North Dakota determined that Amazon had censored for political or religious reasons, um, they would be empowered to cancel that contract with Amazon World Services. So that's what that, um, that example is. So here's where we're at. And I, the, this is where I'm, uh, I'll try not to belabor the points that James and uh, Brent made, but I do want to lean into two two things here, uh, the second and the third bullet point. Uh, simply that just because Congress deems a market free does not a free market make. The fact that Section 230 exists is prima facie evidence that it's not a free market. Free markets exist separate and precede legislation. So legislation saying something's a free market doesn't make it so. But if you, by going to the third point, the most narrow interpretation of Section 230 is what will preserve the free speech of users on these social media websites. But here's what we're hearing in the states. The opposition obfuscations, as I'm calling them. One of them is that Twitter, Facebook, et al. claim to have First Amendment protections 
to act or to censor. But this goes back to the point that they have First Amendment protections insofar by what has been granted to them in Section 230. Um, and further, um, Section 230 makes big tech curators of content, not publishers of content. Um, therefore, the First Amendment applies differently and more narrowly. So for example, YouTube is not the New York Times. The New York Times, as a publisher, enjoys very wide and very broad First Amendment protections, whereas Twitter and Facebook do not have that broad of a protection under the First Amendment. Um, I talked about why, and Jim or James talked about why the internet is, is in a free market. But number three is interesting because as I've testified in almost a dozen states now, one issue that keeps coming up and it, I, I think pernicious is the best way to describe it, is that AI and tech can't catch all these infractions that might otherwise exist. And therefore, they would be exposed to these tort claims, these, uh, these civil causes of action. And it seems to me, and, and, it, and if somebody wants to make a different case, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to hear about it. But this claim that the AI and the tech and the algorithms are, will not catch all infractions and therefore expose big tech to, to these torts is bothersome because it seems to suggest that political and religious speech is collateral damage in this pursuit of perfection of a perfect algorithm. And I counter to turn that on its head and say that free speech should never be, never, ever, ever be the collateral damage of, uh, uh, of, a, uh, of an effort of, or of an algorithm. And then lastly, and this, this one similarly it, it is a, a bit frustrating from my perspective, that these bills will allow child predators and terrorists content. I mean, I've, I've actually heard it asserted in committee meetings that ISIS will be able to recruit on Twitter or on Facebook, or that child predators will have protected speech. And that's, for starters, Section 230 does not allow that. But let's suppose, for argument's sake, that ISIS is, is, is trying to recruit in North Dakota. Well, if ISIS is recruiting in, in North Dakota and Twitter censors them and they want to bring a cause of action in North Dakota, I say stand up, ISIS, show yourself. Bring, avail yourself of the justice system so we can see who these ISIS recruiters are in North Dakota. It's, it's basically national security. But all of this comes together in, in, in one point. The answer is not to censor. The answer is simply, if we do not like speech, political or religious speech, or if we find it disagreeable, or if we want to, it, or if we don't like it and, and our instinct is to censor it, our instincts ought to be that we need more speech. The best antidote to speech with that with which we disagree is more speech. With that, I'll, I'll stop um, ranting and raving over here. Um, if anybody has questions for the three of us, um, presumably James, and I know Brent is far smarter than I am and they might have better opinions than I do. So I'll turn it over to questions to them. Okay, uh, we actually have some questions here. Uh, Cameron, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Get everybody back up on here. Uh, one of the early questions here we, we got gentlemen was, uh, and I think it's a, it's a good one, you know, and I'll just put it in a little bit of context, just the idea that you know, uh, Brent, you and the Heartland Institute and what is it, 70 other organizations are part of this free speech alliance. And then we're fighting back on this, you know, together and, and bringing attention to it. But, you know, one person who watches this happening on Twitter or 
or they used to have an account on Parler, or they, they're on Facebook and they see that they're not, uh, you know, they're being suppressed or they're trying to monetize their YouTube page and that's not being allowed either, all based on their point of view. What is it that the average citizen can do right now to fight back against this online censorship by these, uh, as James Taylor calls them, the big tech cartel? Well, I think, I think there, there are um, uh, several things that we can look at. I said that nothing's going to pass in Congress in the next four years. Uh, Republicans could capture uh, the House and capture the Senate, um, but the, the, the administration of the White House is going to veto anything that they attempt to do. That doesn't mean you don't agitate. That doesn't mean you don't set the table to do something if, uh, if, if, if the, the, the left is replaced on Capitol Hill. Um, you can look at various suggestions on Section 230. Um, I, I thought that Cameron had a lot of interesting things and very smart things to say about it. There are those who agitate about taking away Section 230 completely. Um, there are those who, like the American Principles Project, that have suggested a more targeted approach on it to, to look at the uh, egregious behavior and to target those major corporations, but to give a fighting chance to those that would challenge the titans on it. Uh, free speech is not, never was an open-ended proposition. You can't yell a fire in a the movie theater. You can't drop the F-bomb in, in your license plate. If, but within the, those very, very defined specific exemption, uh, exceptions of it, you know, promoting terrorists is, is something you can't do and you shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, promoting egregious, egregious um, uh, violent behavior is something you can't do. Pedophilia is something you can't do. Um, but those are very, very specific exceptions to the, to, to, to the rule. Everything else should be allowed and the public should be agitating with their representatives on Capitol Hill, do something about this. Look at these companies. This is something where, where interestingly enough, you're starting to see a bit of a left-right um, uh, alliance starting to take place on antitrust legislation. You've got the, you've got the Ted Cruz's of the world uh, that, that are saying these companies are too powerful. You've got the Elizabeth Warrens that are saying these companies are too rich. Well, I think it's one and the same thing. In effect, all I care about is competition. Or should you be allowed to compete? And as James pointed out, as Cameron has pointed out, they destroy you if you try to compete. So you've got to break them up. I want to make one final point on this because this is very, very important. These companies are chartered in the United States. They do not see themselves as American companies. No, you'll never hear them talk about themselves as an American company. It's always a community. What does community mean? Community means that they're going to listen to the world and they're looking at specifically the European model, not the American model. We believe in the constitution. We put, the, we put freedom over virtue. The European model puts virtue over freedom. Now, virtue is what they define to be virtue. And therefore, they really do see this as a virtuous thing to try to destroy Donald Trump, to try to destroy the Heartland Institute, to try to destroy the, uh, the conservative movement. They see this as a virtuous thing, as a good thing. They don't believe in the Constitution, meaning they don't believe in the First Amendment. They don't believe in the Second Amendment. But the other thing I was saying, and, and, I'll, and I'll stop it with this. If you recall what happened two years ago uh, with the Covington kid, that, that teenage boy who went to the Right to Life uh, march and was so viciously maligned in the press, so much so that his attorney got apparently a very handsome um, uh, settlement from CNN. Now. What, L, what entity did more damage to him, CNN or Facebook, CNN or Twitter, CNN or YouTube, CNN and the one we haven't mentioned so far, which is the most powerful one of them all, Google. Which one did greater damage? Well, these, these social media sites did a thousand times as much damage to this kid and his reputation as did CNN. 
if CNN had to pay a handsome <laughs> settlement, can you imagine what Facebook would have had to pay, what Twitter, Google, YouTube, what those companies would have had to pay had this kid had the right to take them to court for slander? That's why. That's why they're fighting with, two, with everything they've got. That's why they're dropping tens of millions of dollars into Washington, D.C., buying as much, many lobbyists as they can. Watch the conservatives that are being bought. Watch the conservatives that are taking money from these companies. Um, this, it's disgraceful that they're doing that. But that's what these companies do when they've got the money that they've got. So the other thing that I would do is, is prepare a whole bunch of lawsuits. How about that? That'll do. Add, yeah, if I can add also, uh, we at the Heartland Institute published uh, just recently uh, six principles for state legislators seeking to protect free speech on social media platforms. Read that, share that with your legislators, because again, it is a myth that federal law preempts the states from creating legislative causes of action. If a state legislature were to create such a cause of action and says that any entity, any internet provider that censors political speech is going to be subject to say, let's just throw out a number, $100,000 per instance, well, this would stop in a hurry. And uh, the notion that, that the federal law preempts it simply doesn't exist. Okay, in the I'm, comments, some of the folks who, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Brent. I, I'm sorry, I just meant to once, to, 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 your, to, your, to the question that was asked, follow the lead of Heartland, uh, much more so than the Media Research Center, because I think the quickest action is going to be at the state level. So organizations like Heartland really have their thumb on the pulse of things. Yeah, and thanks for that endorsement. And I think we do. And I think that the states can act and they should act. Yes. So another, another question. Yeah, yeah just I can quickly address something because I've seen it. Maybe you would be calling on the menu. I've seen in the comments or the questions uh, a couple of notes about, well, why shouldn't this entity be able to exercise its free speech rights? Well, keep in mind, Facebook and Twitter do not exist in, in a free market in a natural state of things. They exist because of corporation law that has bestowed certain protections and certain privileges on corporations. These aren't individuals. These are conglomerations. These are groups. These are profit-making enterprises. Now, if we decide that they still have free speech rights, the free speech right to shut someone else down, to silence someone else's speech is not a free speech right. They have a free speech right to give their own opinions. But free speech doesn't mean that I can tell my neighbor that can forcibly prevent him from speaking. And in this case, what you have, this isn't 1776 where we have a town square and people share their opinions. The overwhelming manner in which people not only do, but even can share their thoughts these days is on the internet. That's, that's, that's pretty much the only way people are out there sharing thoughts, political thoughts with their friends, with their neighbors, with people around the state, with people around the country. And we're talking about a corporate entity, a corporate entity shutting down free speech because they disagree with that speech, they're gonna shut it down and nobody else can say it. Folks, our free speech rights trump anything else. They certainly trump a corporation's right. As they say, well, why can't they go out and do what they want and try and make a profit? <laughs> they're, already, they're already operating outside of free markets, but most importantly, shutting down someone else's speech, that is simply we cannot tolerate in this country. And I suspect that anybody who's really making that point is probably receiving a good amount of money from these corporations in the process of making that argument. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of what, you know, what Section 230 allows or doesn't allow and whether you're treated as a publisher or as a platform. And it's kind of like I reminded of uh, John Stewart when he was in his heyday, you know, he did be clown nose on and clown nose off, you know, like, oh, I'm just a comedian. So what I'm saying doesn't really matter. But oh, now, but it's really important. You should pay attention and get your news from me. And the, it seems to me the big tech companies are trying to have it both ways as well. We're a platform when it serves us well, but we're a publisher when we feel like taking something off and putting something else back on. And, you know, there's lots of different views on this. One of mine, the first thing I think of is, you know, Section 230, we don't have to repeal it. How about we try enforcing it? How about trying to make sure that these, that these principles, as we've discussed uh, often in this, in this webinar, is that, you know, it has to be a good faith effort and you can't just silence somebody um, because you disagree with their politics. And that is obviously what has been happening uh, for this, for, well, 
since uh, somebody somebody that didn't like got elected to the White House. Let's just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> we have some, we have a question. One of the questions from people here in the in the uh, watching this webinar is, is whether they there will be a recording of this. And yes, we are recording this. We'll be placing it on uh, Heartland Institute's YouTube page. Media Research Center may do it uh, themselves. Maybe if we both do it, Brent, they won't. They can't block both of us, or maybe they will. It'll be even bigger news. But uh, everybody that's on this webinar also will be getting a, an email with the, with the link so that they can uh, share it with their friends as well after that. Uh, another question here in the time that we have left, uh, are there, quote, are there any attorneys in touch with state legislators to make them aware of what's happening here? As a taxpayer, I do my part, but feel it doesn't have any teeth in it. If an organization were to contact elected officials, I would hope it would carry uh, some more weight. Any comment on that, Cameron, or anyone else here on the group? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. So as I noted, when I first um, started speaking, I'm in Nashville um, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday talking to legislators, letting them know that this issue is out there. They're having committee hearings on legislation, and, and I'm speaking with them in the same way that I'm speaking with you. Last week, I was in, oh shoot, I lost, I lost track where I was. I was in Bismarck, North Dakota last week, and I was in uh, Montana before that, and Wyoming before that, and um, I've testified um, in, in Iowa and Missouri, and I'm going to keep going around and uh, be Johnny Appleseed on big tech censorship on this issue, because it's that important to the Heartland and to... Um, the Media Research Center. Uh, I'm not an Cameron, attorney. Being modest, I think it's important to point out, Cameron Schulte and his team, they have been directly communicating with state legislators, I believe in all 50 states. If it's not all 50, it's pretty darn close. And so what we're doing at Heartland is we're making sure, not just by, I, I think it's fantastic we published our six principles document. I hope legislators will read it. But we're not just publishing things and hoping people will read them. Cameron Schulte and his team are in direct communications, traveling face to face, in person, Zoom meetings, telephone conversations, et cetera, and, uh, and, and, and letting them know that you do have the power to do this. Don't be talked into thinking that there is absolute federal preemption that does not exist. But yeah, we're working really hard face to face to make sure state legislators know all of the arrows that they have available in their quiver. Cameron, you're doing a great job. Thank you. All right, terrific. Hey, uh, Brent, I wonder if you might be able to address this, uh, this head on. Steve Del Bianco, I uh, had a couple questions here. Um, one of them was, it's basically about the First Amendment. He says that the First Amendment is what empowers big tech to censor whatever they want. Section 230 is just about lawsuits for hosting or removing user posts. Can you ex please explain how states can force social media to carry speech that they don't want, uh, given the First Amendment? And as a bit of a follow-up, he says that the New York Times is a corporation and they enjoy First Amendment protection against these state laws that you guys are advocating. So Brent, I wonder if you might be able to, to address that. Well, I, I don't want to address because I'm not an expert on, on state okay. law, uh, on, on how it's done. Uh, but the New York Times uh, is held liable for, for statements that, that um, are, could come on its site. It's a publisher. Um, and there's no reason whatsoever that Facebook or Twitter uh, or Google or YouTube uh, should be held to a different standard than, than the New York Times. Um, you know, what is it that they're afraid of? If they were, in fact, platforms, they would never be held liable for this. If they allowed, as Cameron said, if they allowed as much speech as possible on there with the very, very specific limits that you have on there, if they allowed everything else, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We have to understand just how powerful these people are, but I think, I think more so understand what a threat these people are. Um, the 2008 presidential campaign was decided by Facebook with Obama. The 2012 presidential campaign was decided by Facebook, Obama. The 2016 presidential campaign was decided by Twitter, Trump. The 2020 campaign was decided by all of them, refusing to allow Trump to have a voice. Uh, that's how powerful they are. They can decide who the president of the United States will be by deciding who will and who won't be allowed to it. Uh, they're more powerful than the New York Times. Hey, and I'd like to add that really what it comes down to is this. In, in our society, 
Should we have a society where a few multinational corporations can aggregate this power and then tell Americans that you can't share your political views with each other, that they can shut down our free speech? This isn't their free speech. They're shutting down our free speech. And these aren't, these aren't individuals. These aren't small mom and pop operations where you can compete with them. And when Parler tried to compete with them, they shut them down. They destroyed them. To say that we as Americans should not be able to communicate our political beliefs with each other, that our elected officials cannot communicate with us because of some notion of giant corporation free speech. I mean, come on, who's paying you, Stephen? That's just crazy. I don't. I, I think maybe maybe one percent, maybe 0.1 of one percent of people in this country might actually be more concerned about. And I think it's more important to safeguard a giant international corporation's ability to shoot down our ability to speak with each other, than to side with the people's right to speech. I'm sorry. This is a democracy. We have to be able to share ideas. And saying that uh, that we shouldn't be able to uh, is a free speech right to shut everyone else down. If you accumulate enough power with your corporation, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I have, I have a question. I wonder uh, uh, any of the panelists here can kind of, I don't know, maybe put on their uh, their prediction hats. You know, Parler was was nuked from space by Amazon. Um, I would say that it was it was a coordinated attack uh, on all the media giants, including Apple and, and the rest, taking the uh, taking the app off and all of that. Um, justified on supposedly using that to plan uh, January 6th when actually Facebook and Twitter were used a lot more than that and they didn't suffer any consequences whatsoever. But um, maybe this is a good one for Brent as, as to what is the future here? I mean, I've actually tried to reinstate my parlor account and they still will not take new, uh, new accounts. I, at least I can't log in. I've tried it for two weeks. I can't start a new account. Um, you know, it seems like there have been real Real backing, real and real attempts to try to, as they say, if you don't like it, make your own Facebook, make your own Twitter. We've tried, and then it gets it gets destroyed. So, what is the future here, Brent? Do you think people are just going to start unplugging from some of these social media giants and, and basically voting with their feet? And will that actually have any difference? How is this all going to work out? Is big tech going to be made to respect the free speech rights of all Americans, not just Americans that they personally agree with? only when they're brought to heel. Um, they will never do it of their own accord. They've tasted power and boy, does it taste nice. They were able to take out the president of the United States of America. You don't think they, that didn't go to their head? Look at, look at our issues, the right to life movement. The right to life movement, whoops, there's no problem. <laughs> there you go. Um, the right to life movement is, uh, uh, in jeopardy, in the sense that if you can't have a conversation with the American people, your organization, your movement no longer is going to exist. If the only thing you hear is the righteousness um, of, of uh, the abortion uh, industry, of the goodness of Planned Parenthood, if that's all you hear, uh, then the right to life movement is going to be destroyed. Um, the the pro-abortionists, and uh, big tech love this. Um, they're not going to give this up. Um, uh, not until one of these three things stop makes them do it. Either they're broken up and competition is allowed. Section 230 is amended so that they no longer can, can, can have the protections they don't deserve or at the state level actions are taken. Look, all you need is two or three states to be successful and every other state is going to follow with what those states did. So it, you know, it could be a come to Jesus moment for, for, for these people uh, in big tech. Uh, I think the thing to watch is what's coming from Trump world. Um, Trump world is saying they're gonna announce something, uh, something very soon that they're going to do on social media. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if they have found a new way of doing it. I don't know if there's gazillions of dollars behind some new innovation, I don't know. Uh, but they have announced that they're going to do something very soon. So can I address, uh, I, I'm going to circle back because these two come in together. The question earlier, what, what can we do? What can we as just citizens do to, to make an impact? And uh, people even just watching this Zoom meeting and with the potential to contact their legislators, it scares the heck out of the big tech cartel. Your activism makes that difference. You know how we know? So for example, we have the, the gentleman, Steve Del Bianco, who's been posing these questions 
Zito Bianco is the president and CEO of NetChoice, who, by the way, funded by Amazon, Yahoo, Google. What happens when we have a session that's going to inform the people of this country and state legislators what they can do? Big tech loses minds, calls in all their sock puppets and says, please do something. Silence them, disrupt this, shut it down. The fact of the matter is they fear people in this room. They fear people throughout this country stepping up for free speech. And that's what we're doing. Free speech trumps all. Free speech trumps multinational, multi-billion dollar tech cartels. I mean, what, what is their interest in choosing a political side? That's supposed to trump the interest of voters, of citizens who are subject to laws? This is about people versus power. It, there was a day when folks on the left on the establishment told us to fear the big corporations, to fear the, the aggregation of power. But now that they've taken over power, now that they work with government, now that they're protected by government, now all that's forgotten. The fact of the matter is just us standing up for our rights, contacting our state legislators, telling them, hey, you don't even need to change Section 230. You just need to interpret it properly. You just need to tell the courts to do so. That's how we make a difference. That's how we will make a difference. And all the folks who are funded by Google and Yahoo and Amazon, they can complain all they want. But the people have the power in this country, at least for now. Let's not let it slip away. I've always believed, James, uh, to, to your point, I've always believed that in a debate, uh, a left-right debate, the right will always win. We have the ideas, um, and our ideas are proven ideas. The left's ideas have been proven failures. This is why they're censoring us. They're, they're deathly afraid of an open debate because they'll lose that debate every single time. We just finished a poll, a national poll. The numbers that have come back are remarkable. In 13 different issues, you're finding that over 80% of the American people support us. That means left, right, Republican, Democrat, independents support our position. One of them is stopping big tech. 85, I believe it's 83 or 85% of the American people agree with us. Jim, you're on mute still. Goodness gracious. All right. If I wasn't on mute one time during this webinar, well, we didn't do it right, I guess. I want to thank everybody for being here and taking time out of your afternoon uh, to spend an hour with us and with the, uh, with the wonderful Brent Bozell from the Media Research Center, from Cam Cameron Schulte, the Heartland Institute's Director of Government Relations, our President James Taylor, and myself, Jim Lakely, Vice President and Director of Communications. Just a reminder that this, uh, this whole webinar is going to, has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube. Everyone that's been here uh, will get an email with a link to it. We hope you will share with your friends. Go ahead try to put it on Facebook. Let's see how long it stays up there. Uh, and we thank you for this. And we'll be in touch with you with even more great webinars like this about promoting freedom, not just in the digital space, but in real life as well. Thanks you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.